Thank you. So it's extraordinary to reflect now, after a gap of nearly 40 years, just how challenging and shocking the AIDS epidemic was when it first appeared in 1981. The whole history of the 20th century up to then had been one of the control of infectious diseases, first by general public health, then by the discovery of antibiotics, and of course, most important of all, by the suite of really safe and effective vaccines against common childhood diseases that occurred throughout the whole century. So when the first AIDS cases appeared and began killing previously healthy young adults in some of the wealthiest countries on the planet, it was clear that our confidence of the control of infectious diseases was misplaced. And you don't have to go much further than the headlines on the papers today to realize that that confidence is still misplaced. So the scientific response to the HIV epidemic was completely extraordinary. So HIV, the causative virus, was isolated, sequenced, characterized by 1984. The first drug became available by 1987. And then with the engagement of the pharmaceutical industry, who made a suite of new drugs, throughout the early 1990s, a series of pivotal clinical trials, many conducted here in London by the Medical Research Council, showed that combinations of these antiretroviral drugs could completely suppress viral replication in infected individuals. So much so that anyone newly infected by HIV today, starting on these combination drugs, will live a normal, healthy life and can expect a normal life expectancy, uh, an extraordinary achievement. These drugs are actually so powerful that they can even prevent HIV infection, the so-called pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. So now if you're at risk of HIV, you can take one pill once a day, and you have a high degree of protection from infection. The downside is people find it quite hard to take a pill a day to, when they're perfectly well to prevent ill health in the future. But despite these fantastic advances and these wonderful drugs, we've not got on top of the transmission of HIV. So to give you an example, last year in London, 10 young gay men became newly HIV infected every single working day, 2,700 in the year. Globally, just under 2 million people became HIV infected, despite access to these extraordinary drugs all over the world. So I absolutely believe, just like the control of infectious diseases is best achieved by a safe and effective vaccine. We need an HIV vaccine. So that's where I sort of enter the story. And in 1999, I set up a consortium with six colleagues across five European countries to try and develop an HIV vaccine. So future viewers of this in the years to come will want to know that European collaboration could be a really wonderful thing. <laughs> and uh, we set out to try and make a vaccine. So how do vaccines work? Well, vaccines are a way of mimicking real infection, such that the body produces an immune response, so that when, uh, with a long-lasting memory of that immunity, so that when you confronted by a the real infection in the years to come, your primed immune system is able to rapidly generate immunity to prevent infection taking hold. And the earliest vaccines that were created were very simple killed organisms, where an organism is just grown in tissue culture, fixed with glutaraldehyde. Uh, and that, for example, was the earliest typhoid vaccine, or indeed the first polio vaccine by Salk. Subsequently, the childhood vaccines have used attenuated organisms, whereby viruses, for example, grown repeatedly in the laboratory in serial culture, and then selected for those which have no pathogenicity. They've lost the ability to cause disease, but are still able to replicate enough to induce the right immune response. And these live attenuated vaccines have now the basis of all the common vaccines for childhood infection that we're familiar with, and the Sabin poliovirus, the one we all remember from the sugar cube, 
is such an example of these. So why don't we have a vaccine against HIV? Well, I believe there are three challenges that have to be overcome. The first is that there's no natural immunity to HIV. No one gets infected with HIV, mounts an immune response, shakes off the virus, never to be infectable again. And there's no real animal model for HIV. We can infect non-human primates with the virus, but they don't develop disease. Uh, and finally, the virus is highly variable, and that always presents a problem for vaccine development. So how did we get together and decide how to make one of these vaccines? So what we tried to do was to develop a strategy to produce the most durable, the most potent, uh, and the broadest immune response that we could. The earliest approaches for an HIV vaccine had tried a fixed inactivated approach, but the virus is very fragile, and the fixed inactivated virus was completely non-immunogenic. Then there was a great deal of attention to the outer shell of the virus. Now, the shell is the part of the virus that antibodies will bind to that will prevent infection. And so a great deal was work, around, work was done on these shell proteins as a vaccine. But they are poor at producing the right immune response. And although they were immunogenic, there just wasn't enough of the right antibodies produced to lead to protection. So with that as our starting point, we determined to use not one, but a combination of vaccines and use sequentially to try and get the maximal immune response that we could. So we plan to prime with one vaccine and then come in weeks later and boost with another. And the other was slightly different in terms of its strain that it used to give a broader response uh, across the patch. And for a prime, we are using a uh, DNA, piece of naked DNA expressing four HIV genes from the core and the shell. And then for the boost, a modified vaccinia, the vaccine that was used against smallpox, bearing the same HIV genes, but from a different strain. And this prime boost approach, as it's not unnaturally called, uh, is what we've gone into the clinic. Will it work? Well, we've studied this combination of prime boosts in hundreds of healthy volunteers now, initially in London, and then with colleagues across East Africa. And we can say it's safe and it's immunogenic. And it seems to be producing most of the immune responses we'd expect to see that will lead to protection against infection. But the only way to know what's going to happen is to do a field trial. And that is a trial we've called PrepVax. And we're combining these vaccines with pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, because our vaccines take quite a long time to induce immunity. The duration of immunization is long. And we're using the drugs to protect during that period. It's a combination protection approach. So PrepVax began last year. We begin immunizing in Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, and South Africa in healthy men and women in about two weeks' time. If you want to know the outcome of that study, you have to invite me back in 2023. Thank you.